I don't know about you, but I watch a lot of YouTube videos. And for many of you, you watch YouTube videos for the funny videos that uh, you are able to watch. A cat doing this, a dog doing that. For others, you watch clips from movies or, or clips from sporting events. For me, I use YouTube almost exclusively for how-to videos. If something breaks in our house or something breaks on one of our cars, I right away go to YouTube before I even go to a mechanic or one of the experts because what I've come to realize is that the problem that I'm dealing with in the moment, surely one of the other 8 billion people on the earth have at some point came to the same problem and my hope and prayer is someone has videoed themselves finding the solution. So recently, uh, our son Josh's uh, Durango that he drives, we call her the uh, silver bullet. She's a beaut, rust everywhere, and she's breaking down over 250,000 miles. And just recently, we were told seatbelt no longer work, which was an issue for mom. So an Uber driver, because nobody could sit in the seat next to him, everybody had to sit in the back seat where the seatbelts worked. And Amanda came to me and said, you gotta fix the seatbelt, you gotta fix the seatbelt. And I could just see dollar signs flashing this was gonna cost all this money on a car that we're not even sure how long we'll keep. And so I went to YouTube, Dodge Durango, seatbelt. There's a video of a guy working on the exact problem, and in 10 minutes he showed and true to form, pausing and rewinding how I was able and listen I am not very mechanical at all but step me about 45 minutes to watch this 10 minute video I was this day works beautifully how awesome the rise that we would have someone Face the same problem and has come as to the problem that befalls us. Listen, I have a, uh, a furnace at our house that I've almost replaced every part using YouTube videos. Now, I'll probably go home today and it will be dead, but up to this point, YouTube has helped me greatly. Uh, what I've come to realize is YouTube are kind of the videos that are insights for living. They show me the problem, but they also show me the solution. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, we have the insights for living. What we have is the ultimate how-to passage. The problem is seen in chapter 6, verse 12, when he says, what good is it for man? Meaning, what is man supposed to do with this lot in life that he has? In Ecclesiastes 7.14, it tells us the insights for living. And there are three of them this morning, and I'm going to go through them as quickly as I can. Number one, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. Number two, in the day of adversity, consider. And then number three, recognizing God has made one as well as the other. So the is found in living life the way God wants us to. So here Solomon has laid forth a YouTube video for us. He's declared the problem, the problem that each of us face, and he's given us the solution, the step-by-step -step solution to the problem that we find ourselves in. Now here is the issue. What Solomon is going to say is that these things that he is going to articulate are the roadmap to the good life. The world would say he's off his rocker. They would say that what he is about to lay forth is simply to be a glutton for punishment. Uh, to enjoy times of adversity seems like what the world would say is the dumbest thing that you could do. Number two, this is an important truth that he's going to lay forth because what he's laying forth is things that we often are too busy to see the significance of. And number three, uh, we find ourselves being tempted by the world and not living these things out and as a result losing out in the good life God wants us to have. So let's look at these three things, these how-tos, these insights for living. The first one is enjoy life, don't take the good for granted. He says this, 
A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death is better than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth, or the house of parties. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the songs of fools for as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. Let's stop there. Solomon is going to compare the good with the better. And the problem is, is he's going to say, the good times are good, but better are the hard times. And we'll get to that in a moment. But I want you to recognize that inherent within our text is that there are good times to enjoy. He says quite, quite clearly in verse 14, in the days of prosperity, be joyful. Another translation says, when life is good, enjoy it. Still another one says, when good times come, take them for what they are. And that's an important truth for us today because it's easy when we read the book of Ecclesiastes to see Solomon as a bit of an Eeyore figure. We begin to look at him and he's the one that is all down about life. It's meaningless, it's vain. It's a chasing after the wind. But remember, he's creating a contrast. The contrast of living life apart from God compared to the life that you live with God. The good life is living it in cooperation and partnership with the God who created you. The meaningless, the vain life is a life that you live under the sun apart from God. And so here Solomon says, for those who want to live with God in mind, with eternity in mind, he wants us to know something. That is, number one, to enjoy life. To enjoy life. He says five times in chapter six that we are to enjoy life. 30 times in the other book that he wrote, the book of Proverbs, he talks about the great joy that there is in life. Now notice in this passage all the things you are to enjoy. Number one, a good name. Number two, the day of one's birth. Number three, the moment of feasting. Number four, the opportunity for laughter. Number five, words of flattery or good other people pay you. Uh, number six, new beginnings or fresh starts. Number seven, the good old days. Number eight, receiving an inheritance. Number nine, living in knowledge and wisdom. All of these things mark the good moments of life. And if we're really honest, it's us through our lives. What Solomon says is for a lot of life, it's mundane. For a lot of life, there's a monotony to it. And there's these moments, these momentous, magnificent moments uh, that come out of sometimes nowhere. Opportunities where the lot falls uh, favorably for us. Uh, we have these moments. We call them special occasions. We, we call them the holidays. We, we gather family and friends for these moments. These are the graduation days. These are the wedding days. These are the anniversary days. These are days of uh, promotion. These are the kids' award ceremonies. They're the kids' concerts. These moments that we go and, and it's something special. These are those moments that we don't want to pass when we're living in them. I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say that probably for every one of us, there's a moment in the future we're looking forward to. Maybe it's the holidays, and you're looking forward to, for Amanda, the best time of the year is that time between uh, the holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas. She eats it up. She loves it. She looks forward to it. If she's got to endure 11 months of all the other stuff, it's all worth it for the month of the Christmas celebration. Uh, for Amanda and I, we're going to uh, be traveling this week. We've got a great opportunity to go out to the Phoenix area. And, and we're going to go, and it's going to be me and my sweetheart. And we're going to have a, a great time as we're there. And so I'm looking forward to Tuesday through Saturday. And, and I'm going to be preaching next Sunday. And it's okay to preach on Sunday. Why? Because I'll be in Phoenix when I'm prepping for that sermon. It's going to be great. 
And so there's been things in these last couple of weeks that it's like, hey, uh, I'm going to get through it. I'm going to hunker down and accomplish things because I'm going on vacation for a short time. And, and I get to enjoy that. And so each of us have those moments and what God is saying through his word is we need to enjoy them. That is, we need to slow down and allow those moments to not pass by us. But sadly, for many of us, while we want those moments to last forever, they don't. They don't, and, and the problem with those moments is they don't teach us a lot. What Solomon's going to say is those moments are good. Enjoy them, but there's not much learning that we need to do. And maybe that's part and parcel as to why we enjoy them so much. Maybe we like vacations because we don't have to think. Maybe we like the holidays because we just get to relax a bit. But inherent within these moments for many of us is the inability to enjoy let me explain a couple of reasons why. For many of us, we're task-oriented. And because of that, we move from one project to the next, and we never take time to just stop and, and take stock in uh, all that's been accomplished. No, we move right from one thing to another, never stopping and, and, and just taking some time to reflect on what God has allowed us to accomplish. Still others of us, we're perfectionists. And we see this in the realm of parenting. We don't enjoy parenting because we've pushed upon our kids. We've superimposed on our kids all of these things that they've got to do. And so instead of enjoying the rise and fall of the kids, the mountaintops and the valleys, we're too busy worrying to create this persona that other parents will see and we're pushing our kids to the next thing. And so we can't enjoy the junior high sports world. We can't enjoy the junior high fine arts world or, or, or the test scores because we're on to the next thing. And we're pushing. Well, a B is good, but an A is better. Fresh soft is good, but varsity is better. Or maybe even club. It's good to be on the team and to be a starter, but to be the MVP, we just keep pushing. To be ranked first in your, or fourth in your class is nice, but first would be better. And so we push and we push and we push, and the kid graduates and we cry, and we're like, where did the time go? I didn't enjoy myself. I didn't enjoy what was there, and the kids have grown up, and, and all I've got is a bunch of things that I pushed on my kids. Still others are doing life, and they're so busy in life that they, with their spouse, are just two ships passing in the night. Solomon says we are to enjoy the spouse of our youth. That is, as Amanda and I are celebrating our 25th anniversary this December, it should be like our honeymoon, that we're enjoying one another's company as if we're newlyweds. But for many of us, we've lost that joy because the monotonous moments of life have taken away our joy. And so we look at our spouse not as a, a lover and as a partner in life, but as a roommate. Someone that we work with to raise children and keep a family together. And one day, one of us will be gone. One of us will have the great task of burying the other and we'll look back and say, where did the time go? And we won't have much to show for it because we did not enjoy those moments. Still others of us don't enjoy life because we allow anxiety and worry to fill us. And so the holidays are coming and, and you uh, who find yourself in this spot are worried about all the details the food and the decorations and, and making sure the bucket list is taken care of. And so when the family comes, the thing you've been most looking forward to, your family all being in the same place, you're living with so much angst that before you know it, they're already on their way home and the holidays are over. You didn't enjoy your time because you were too worried about the details of the moment. What Solomon is saying, listen very carefully, is about as practical as the Bible is going to be. When days are good, enjoy them. Now here's what I want you to understand. We as Christians, as Christ followers, should enjoy the good days more than anyone. That is, people should look at us and say, why are they so happy? 
And here's why. Because the good uh, days are not moments of chance or happenstance that just seem to fall in our place every once in a while. But the Bible says to us as, as his children that we have a God in heaven who loves us so much that he showers upon us good. Every good and perfect gift, the book of James says, comes from above. Uh, Jesus says that we have a father who doesn't give us stones, but he, like a good father, gives us good gifts. He wants us to enjoy. And so we wake up each and every day, and God's mercies are new for us. Listen to me, church. For the Christian, every day should be like a little kid's Christmas morning. I get another day. I get another opportunity. I've got a God who loves me and cares for me and he has bestowed his grace and mercy on me one more day and he has given me a job, he's given me a family, he's given me friends, he's given me a church, he's given me salvation. I am celebrating Christmas Day and so I go to work and I'm, sorry, I'm smiling. I'm excited. I'm filled with joy. I'm filled with this sense of great satisfaction because I have a Father in heaven who loves me and who has given me so much. Can I tell you something? You start living like that and people will say, first of all, what's wrong with you? But I think even more, what kind of joy is this? Tell me more about it. But sadly... When we evangelize and we tell people that Christ is our joy and Christ is our satisfaction, they look at us and they say, well, you look as just as miserable as I am, so what change does Christ make? And for some of us, we're not enjoying the life God gives, and if anybody should enjoy it, it should be the people that know that those moments come from God. Enjoy your life. It is a gift from God. God. But listen, you can take that too far. The world enjoys life. The world enjoys life. They take life, all that's under the sun, and they pursue it, and they do everything they can. And, and what they're doing is they're trying to mask, they're trying to fill the void that they can't find to be satisfied. So I was talking with a friend of mine. And he had a day off coming. And I very casually said, what are you going to do on your day off? And he got really, really honest with me. He said, I'm getting together and I'm going to smoke some weed with my friends. This is a grown man. I said, why, why would you do that? And he said this, because it's the only time I'm happy. You see, the world is looking for happiness and they'll do whatever they need to to fill that void in their life. And so they fill it with pills, they fill it with drink, they fill it with drugs, they fill it with sex, they fill it with possessions, and they keep trying to fill it because at the end of the day, the whole goal in life is to enjoy life. Listen, that is not our goal in life. Our goal in life is to enjoy life, but to enjoy even greater the one who gives us the enjoyment of life. And so here's what Solomon says. If you really want to truly enjoy life, then you've got to accept the good and the bad. Notice again, verse 14 is our key verse. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider. All right, so, so we've got these days of good but now we've got days of bad. So what Solomon is saying is in your life, you'll have good days and you'll have bad days. And in the good days, you want to enjoy them. In many ways, the good days are few and far between, so enjoy them for the moments that they are. But bad days are going to come. Hardships are going to take place. You're going to get bad medical news. You're going to have tough financial times. You're going to have issues where maybe spiritually you're not at your best. You're going to have relational struggles that come along the way. There are a lot of things that can make good days turn bad. And what the author here says is, in those moments of adversity, 
examine your life, examine your life, and let the bad make you better. 11 times in our text, he's going to use the word better. This is good, but this is better. He uses this as a contrast. There's this, and then there's that. And so you see that uh, better is a good name than precious ointment. Better is the day of your death than the day of your birth. Better is the house of mourning than the house of feasting. And he goes on. And what he's saying is, is that in the moments of adversity are great opportunities. What he articulates, I like what one paraphrase says, in the day of advers uh, adversity, open your eyes and learn. You see, he doesn't say that about prosperity. Because prosperity, we're just taking it in, we're enjoying it, we're at ease. But when that trouble comes our way, now there's opportunity. There's opportunity for us to get better. There's opportunity for us to recalibrate. There's opportunity for us to evaluate. And we are to evaluate three things this morning. Number one, write this down, your aspirations. Your aspirations. Notice in verse one he says that a good name is better than precious ointment. That is your reputation. That is what you're known for. That's your good name. What are you known for? What is your life all about? My name isn't Badal. When someone says, tell me about Badal, that name, they start talking about the things that are most important to me. And what Solomon says is this. A good name, your aspirations that are following and pursuing good things is better than extravagant or expensive is ointment. What does ointment, perfume, have to do with your name, your aspirations? They have really no connection whatsoever. They're totally different things, except for this. What Solomon is trying to say is that perfume is there for a moment, but as time goes on, it begins to lose its effectiveness. So a lady puts on perfume this morning for church, she does not assume that that perfume that she puts on will be there 10 years from now. She knows, as we know, that perfume's there, and as time goes on, it begins to fade away. What Solomon is saying is, don't allow the things that you aspire after to fade away. And so what he says is, is that your death day is more important than your birthday. A funeral is better than a party. Why? Because in those moments of death, it causes us to think. As I go to funerals and, and, and wakes in these last years, I have disciplined myself in those moments to, as I wait in the receiving line, to think about my own funeral, to think about my own death day. And I'm not thinking about what songs will be sung or what suit I'll wear in the, in the casket. I'm not worried about the bells and whistles that will take place. I'm not even worried about who's going to do the parts of the service. Amanda will have that all figured out. What I want to know is when people walk by me in that box, when people gather together and, and the preacher says, all right, well, does anybody have anything to share about Tim? that what I will be known for will last beyond me. For some of us, we're not thinking about eternity, and so all we're doing is putting on a little perfume that's here in the here and now, but does not last. What Solomon is saying is what makes a good name better is its longevity. Are your aspirations going to outlive you? Will they talk about things at your funeral that will leave a legacy for those who come behind you? Let's go even farther and ask this question. What about your activities? So there's aspirations, now your activities. Notice Solomon says what is better is to literally, as David Gibson says, to live life backwards. 
That is to live with your end in mind. Start at the end and move backwards. For far too many of us, we start at the beginning and we think we're going to figure it out. And at the end, we've not accomplished what we intended to. Uh, listen, uh, we just heard from a man who for the last 50 years has faithfully been serving our Lord. Uh, and Tim Hayes said it, and, and it's true for me, Clyde Murphy has served our Lord in Guatemala longer than I've been alive. Longer than I've been alive. Now here's the crazy thing. It didn't matter so much how he started. It's going to matter how he ends. Couples. You may have had the most extravagant, most beautiful wedding ceremony, but listen to me, it's not how you start a marriage. It's how you end it. Because everybody's excited at the beginning of it. It's easy at the beginning with the potentiality and none of the hard work even, even started yet. It's amazing, and this is the problem with couples today. They see their wedding days as the finish line instead of the starting point. And so it's easy to start out and you think you own the world. But given he's got it all figured out, it's not how you start that job, it's how you end it. And we know all of these things to be true because we've seen individuals who started so well and have ended in such disaster. I have learned this truth as a pastor. It doesn't matter what I did in the early years. The question is, what am I doing now, and how will I finish? And so what is the end result that Solomon wants us to know? Well, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way. It is appointed for man to die once, and then comes judgment. That is, we're going to live this life, whatever amount of years we've been given, if it's 40, 50, 60, 70, maybe uh, my brother died as a teenager, it could be uh, you as a young person will die young. You're going to have one life to live. And then comes judgment. That is, we're going to stand before Almighty God and we're going to give an account for how we lived this life. And what Solomon is saying, start there. Start there and use the activities of your life, both in the good and the bad, that you can with confidence stand before your maker and say, I did the best that I could. I did not waste time. I did not waste my energy on the temporal things that did not last. I dedicated myself, not perfectly, but as best of my ability to the furthering of your kingdom work here in the world. And along the way, you enabled me to enjoy wonderful moments in life. And so when trials and tribulations come, it forces us to ask, what am I doing with my life? When my brother passed away at 16 years of age, my father looked at his activities. He was a grocer and a caterer. And my father came and he had had, he had, had this calling to serve as a pastor for a long, long time. And he came home one day after the loss of his firstborn son and he said, honey, I'm in the wrong vocation. I'm not doing what I believe God has called me to. That is what hard times do. They cause us to reevaluate and to ask, and what I'm investing my time in, is that right? Am I putting my energy in the right things? Am I spending my money the right way? Hard times bring that forth. And they ask, where can I clean up? Where can I fix? And some of us, those moments in time allow for great adjustments. But here's the problem. When hard times come, we get an attitude problem. So there's the aspirations, there's the activities, but now we gotta deal with the attitude. Notice, he goes on and he says, okay, from time to time, because our activities and our aspirations get out of whack, it will be good for someone to rebuke us. Verse five, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the flattery or songs of fools. 
And so from time to time, as we're trying to live the good life, our life gets out of whack, our life gets out of alignment, and we need someone to correct us. We need someone to push a guardrail in a little bit and, and to rub up against us. This is where iron sharpens iron. Sparks, sparks begin to fly. And, and what happens is, notice right on the heels of this, he says, be careful in verse 9 that you're not quick in your spirit to become angry. Solomon knows when people try to correct us, and I wonder if there were individuals trying to correct him, that we start saying, who do you think you are? What gives you the right? And so on. And so we become angry. Notice that the words of flattery in verse 8 are what he says in verse uh, I'm sorry, verse 5 and verse 6 are like crackling of thorns, small sticks, little twigs um, in a fire. That is that they burn really, really quick. If you burn leaves, I know we're not supposed to do that anymore, but if you burn leaves, you take a pile of leaves into a fire, it makes for a huge flame for a moment, and then it dies away. The stuff is burned off. There's no lasting. Once again, he's using this term, what is temporal compared to what is lasting. Now, I get a lot of flattery from people, and I love it. I'll be quite honest with you. People will come out after the service. Maybe you won't do this now, but they'll come out, hey, great sermon, great sermon, great sermon. That's wonderful. But the things I remember are when I've been challenged in my life where a trusted friend has come to me and has said, you know what? The way you're living right now, the activity that I'm seeing in your life, doesn't match what you've said your aspiration is and so fix it and some of you even in this room have had to have some hard conversations with me as your pastor and said hey that isn't what you preach fix it and I will tell you I am indebted to people's tough words that they've shared with me because it has made me better it's made me better. And so find individuals who can share words to you. Now, another thing that is going to make us better, and old people, this is for you, okay? And I'm going to put myself in here because of it. What we begin to do is when adversity falls in the present, we start romanticizing the past. And so notice we become angry. And what do we say in our anger? Verse 10, why were the former days better than these? In essence, where are the good old days? For this is not from wisdom, Solomon says, that you ask this. It's foolishness. And here's why it's foolish. Because you and I look back, and we look back to the Andy Griffith days. We look back to the Leave it to Beaver days. The young people have no idea what I'm talking about. And we say those were the good old days. Well, here's the thing. Barney and Andy and Ward and June, they look back to the generation before and they say those were the good old days. And the generation that's living right now will look 30 years from now and tell the other generation in the future that we right now were living in the good old days. You see the chasing after the wind? It's a myth. There are no good old days. Back then, prices were high. Back then, taxes were bad. Back then, politicians lied. And they do it today. And they had bad times back then. They buried people. They dealt with horrific issues. Now, here's the thing. With every generation comes a new set of challenges, new problems, and so we look at these new problems and say, well, we didn't have those problems back then. I love telling my children this truth. Never once did my parents ever have to ground me from my cell phone. Ever. Never. As a teenager, my head held high. I never had to take, have my cell phone taken away from me. My youngest son said, you must have been really good. <laughs> Why? Because we didn't have cell phones. It wasn't a problem. And so, yes, with every generation comes a new set of problems, but I want to remind you of this. No matter how hard today is, notice what we need to do. We need to embrace our Lord. We need to embrace our Lord, being comforted that he is always in control. Acts 17 tells us that God has placed you, he has sovereignly placed you in this place, in this moment, in this time. He puts you here. 
You remember, God's the creator. God said, all right, it's Bedal's time. He's going to be born to Bill and Michelle. They're going to live in Hinkley. His time frame is going to be 1976, and I don't know when it's going to end. It could be on the way home from church today, which would make for a powerful illustration. I'd be disappointed because we're going to Arizona this week. But heaven's way better than Arizona. But I don't know but this is what I do know that for this moment in this place in this time God has said Tim you're going to experience good you're going to experience bad and in both of those moments in the moments you have from your birth date to your death date here's what it is consider God embrace God grab hold of God you want to make your moments of joy even more joyful? Grab a hold of God. You want to make the moments that are hard and difficult times of pure joy when we consider trials of many kinds? Grab hold of God. You want to make sense of the generation you're living in? Grab hold of God. Because when you do, God will give you the insights for living. And so this is what happens. We know we are embracing God when we do these two things. Number one, when we thank God for every moment. When we thank God for every moment. Job's wife said to Job, after all that had befallen him, curse God and die. It's God's fault. You want to know if you're embracing God? You want to know if you're living the good life? In the good, the bad, and the ugly, you're thanking God. Brothers and sisters, I saw this at 14 years of age. When my parents are burying my brother, they thanked God. Why? Because they know God does all things for the good. Even the hard things. And it doesn't make it easier but my family would say in one voice, the best thing God ever did for our Christ likeness was taking Chris to go home to heaven. And you're like, how can you say that? Because now looking back, I know, I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt, I would not be here had he not died. There's no way. Because in that fire was forged in me a faith that God would use to change a great many lives. And I needed that at 14 because the way I was going was not the way I needed to go and God arrested me in that moment. And so look at your trials and thank God for the good, the bad, and yes, even the ugly in life. And when those trials come, number two, trust God's providence. God's in control. And so in response, Job says to his wife, instead of cursing God and dying, instead, I will sing. Though God gives, and though he takes away, my response will be, blessed be the name of the Lord. You want to enjoy life? Then grab a hold of that truth. Embrace that truth and that Savior and that Lord who's got life all figured out. And I'll tell you, you're going to enjoy the good times and the bad times when you know God's got a plan and he works all things out for the good of those he loves and are called according to his purpose. Amen? So grab a hold of that and you will live the good life that God wants.